Hello, hello, anyone who is joining us right now. I'm about to share on Facebook as well. And that will start momentarily. Here we go. And I'll go ahead and share my screen with that first, that first welcome slide for you as well. Woo. Yeah. We're live. We are here. <laughs> we are here. Um, I feel like a Whoville person, the we are here, we are here, we are here. <laughs> we are here. <laughs> um, awesome. Okay. We're just little thumbnails, but we have, we have a big voice. Precisely, yeah. I mean, isn't that what the world is all about? Mm -hmm. Little thumbnails. <laughs> um, okay, just want to double check here. You're seeing the correct screen, right? The welcome screen? Yep. Yeah, yeah. All good. Sweet. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, as attendees uh, roll in and as we have um, anyone on Facebook who's chatting with us, um, we will get started momentarily, but I'll give it another couple seconds since we're a little rolling. Rolling. Okay. Glad we're all here. Oh, hi, darling. Oh, yay. I had like one few too many screens and now I can see you. Okay. Awesome. All right. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and get started in the meantime. So welcome, everyone, um, anyone who's on Facebook and whoever is in our attendee list. Uh, welcome to another one of the SciStarter Live events. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the largest uh, fungi, 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 it kind of depends on the person. I will hope that the guest actually talks about that briefly, because I'm curious what the preferred pronunciation is for our guest. Um, the largest fungi bioblitz in North America's history um, has just ended, so we wanted to do a shout out to that project and what's next for that um, for that topic. So just to give some quick introductions regarding who is here, we have kind of a full house here, so um, I'll go, it's just starting for myself. Uh, my name is Emma Giles. I am a program coordinator for SciStarter. Um, I host these live events along with others, um, depending on who is uh, involved in the particular topic. Um, yeah, and I plan events for uh, SciStarter as well. Uh, Roland, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yeah, hello. Uh, I also help Emma with preparation of live events and I'm going to be your support today. Awesome. Uh, and Bob is here with us today, which is new. So hello. Can you? Uh, Wahoo, yeah. I'm Bob Hershon. <laughs> I am a podcast producer and host for SciStarter and also um, the uh, founder of uh, Science Update and host of that uh, radio show and website. Awesome. Uh, and then Trevor, you're not on this page, but we do want to hear from you. Trevor, can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about who you are? A little mini intro. Yeah, uh, my name is Trevor. I am a volunteer for SciStarter. Um, for today, I'll be posting links in the Zoom chat for the various resources. So can't wait to nerd out on mycology today. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Darlene, would you like to give a quick intro? Give you a couple seconds. Maybe not. <laughs> okay, I'll keep moving, but feel free to interrupt me in a minute here since we're not fully done with introductions anyway. All right. Um, so uh, just like every SciStarter Live event, if you've been with us before, uh, we do have a webinar format, and so we're looking at the chat function and the Q&A function. Um, if you would like to use the chat function, that's to share any messages, any thoughts you have towards the subject, um, and any direct messaging to myself or our IT support, Roland, um, to help you out. Uh, that's for the chat usage. Um, and to check that you know how to use the chat, uh, we wanted to just give a little welcome introduction. So if you'd like to introduce yourself in the chat and share the name of your favorite type of mushroom, that would be amazing. For example, my name is Emma, and my favorite mushroom is, or fungus in general, is the devil's tooth, which is really wild looking. And I'm really excited to look at another picture of it later because I put them in the slides. So if you would like to share, feel free. <laughs> um, and in the meantime, we also have Q&A. So if you have any questions about mycology, if you have questions about citizen science or SciStarter um, or anything related to the featured program, we're happy to help you there as well. Um, awesome. I know you added the red-legged jelly baby onto the, uh, onto the I just site. like the name, really. I mean, I, I don't have any personal connection to them, but I just like <laughs> that name. Fair enough, yeah. <laughs> they are a fun name, the lion's mane. Yeah. yeah. I've never, I don't think I've ever eaten lion's mane. Um, all right, and then Robert and then Corteau. 
Robert Corto. That's right. Amazing. Um, we have another introduction for you later on when we get to the topic, so you can talk about all of your things. But if you want to just give a quick shout out to who you are, that would be awesome for right here. Sure. So Robert Corto. Um, I'm a former chef turned into uh, amateur mycologist, I suppose. Um, running Think Fungi, which is a nonprofit uh, that's focused on uh, research and conservation education of fungi. Um, <laughs> there you go. Uh, Just alternate. <laughs> And uh, Canadian, so there's that. Cool. Uh, yeah. What time zone are you on? If you mind. Eastern time zone. Eastern, okay, great, yeah. cool. This was easy then, right? <laughs> um, awesome, okay, and then we'll come back to your background as well in a minute here. Um, but for anyone who is involved in our attendee list or anyone who's on Facebook who would like to join in on um, the SciStarter webinar, um, the link should be in the Facebook chat for you as well. Um, but I want to know, have you ever participated in a citizen science project before? Have you ever been involved? Um, and we'll go ahead and post that link for you. Can you run the poll, Emma? Sorry? Can you run the poll? Yeah. Yes. You. Have you ever participated in a citizen science project? There you go. Awesome. Oh, thank you for responding in the um, in the Q and A. Thanks. Awesome. Okay. Oh, looks like a hundred percent of us have have participated Woo! in citizen science. That's a good thing. We can probably like breeze over some of the explanation. <laughs> Get to do a quick recap on that. That's awesome. Awesome. Okay. And then beyond just being a part of citizen science, um, have you ever attended one of these events before? And I did not send it. I apologies. Here you go. <laughs> Now it's launching. Here you go. Have you ever been to one? Are you back? Are you new? Okay, most of us has been, have been here before. That's awesome. Okay, that's great to know. And then for the few of us who have not, welcome. I'm so glad you've joined us. Um, I'm gonna end that poll and share that briefly. All right, and then lastly, I just wanna know what type of people we are before we move forward so we can kind of help guide it towards um, the type of person, um, uh, yeah, the topic yeah. towards the type of person we're talking to. So mm. any of these are up for grabs. Hiring citizen what scientists, what a, student, am I? a parent, teacher. What um, would you be classified as, Bob? I don't or know. I'm none of the above or all of the above. <laughs> I'm all of the above. Okay. I mean, that's not a thing. Vibes. I'm not a librarian. <laughs> ah, okay. So that one will work. Okay, we're pretty much split across and you might have answered more than one, theoretically. Not positive oh, if you're allowed to. Um, amazing. That. All right, so we're looking at researchers, librarians, students, and aspiring citizen scientists. Love it. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing that. Um, thank you for participating in that. All right, so to give you a quick recap on what citizen science is, if you need that, um, citizen science is the collaboration uh, between scientists and those of us who are curious, concerned, and motivated to make a difference. Um, it's how people can make an impact on issues they care about and help actual real science too. Um, so it's a big, uh, big community that we have, and we have a first step on getting involved, which all of us I think are familiar with, but our number one thing always, and anyone you want to tell about citizen science is join SciStarter, because we have a database of sorts of all these uh, projects that are being brought in, um, completing projects, and being uh, super useful to big crowdsourced uh, projects that you are probably pretty familiar with, right? Um, and then in addition to joining SciStarter, we do have training, um, and that helps us gain a lot of confidence in being involved. So if you ever want to gain in confidence and you're not sure where to get started, a really good starting point is the foundations training, which goes through the basics. And then we have several follow-up trainings. We have four of them, um, the newest one being data ethics for practitioners. Uh, and we had a live event a couple weeks ago for data literacy. So, and if you're a librarian, which I know one of us was, there is one specifically for librarians, which is um, super helpful because it gives you very pointed advice on how to get started. Alrighty, so I'm actually going to turn it over to Bob um, to carry us on into our introduction of our guest and the actual project we'll be talking about. So mm -hmm. I'll go ahead and do that. Okay. All right. 
Well, so thanks for uh, thanks for joining us, Robert. Do we do we have the next slide, which actually has uh, Robert's uh, information, uh, and we can talk? About, yes, there we are. Um, so, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and and um, you know how you got involved in um, in fungi before we get into the actual um, uh, fungi quest and uh, learn more about that? Yeah. So, uh, as I said, I was uh, I'm a former chef um, and was you know started off my career uh, uh, here in Canada in Ottawa um, and it eventually led me to the Czech Republic so okay. I, <laughs> of course as it will <laughs> exactly yeah people like to travel you know we like to go to Europe and so I got to see what the uh, the old world has in terms of culinary value so I ended up over there and I was uh, I was cooking over there and um, people I knew over there told me to get involved in uh, to try out the national pastime, which is basically uh, mushroom hunting. So pretty much anywhere, huh. uh, you know, pretty much the further east you go in the, in Europe, the more mushroom hunting becomes a thing. So people who are from, you know, Poland, Ukraine, Czech Republic, Slovakia kind of areas, um, they, they definitely know what I'm talking about. Um, huh. But, you know, that's why you still have that truffle cultures going on in Italy and, and France and whatnot, but mm -hmm. it becomes kind of the whole shebang when you get to the Eastern Europe. So um kind of went out but i didn't have field guides and uh it was really dependent on the neighbor um and the neighbor didn't speak any english and i didn't speak any czech uh <laughs> so it, it was a little it was a little sketchy at the time and this was going back over 10 years ago now so you know the cell phone i brought into the woods with me was not exactly uh, the best cell phone for getting good reception to find you know uh the eye naturalist uh yeah spotting it's on, dangerous on if you get the wrong mushroom i mean <laughs> exactly so well that the, they, the neighbor told me there was three mushrooms that were edible so um okay. those are the three that i always kept on going for and eventually i realized that there was probably more than three edible mushrooms uh so i started to learn those then i realized i should probably learn the poisonous ones Good idea. Uh, so, you should have started with that, but that's you'd okay. Think, right? you'd think. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I started to learn some of the poisonous ones. Eventually moved back to Canada here, um, where I just continue to learn. It's an entirely different ecosystem of, of mushrooms here. So I had to restart everything and and learn from the from the very beginning. Then uh from there just kind of fell into actually the science of of of, of fungi and uh, everything that they do. Um, it's actually an extraordinary little world, uh, super niche, obviously, not many people know much of anything about, about fungi. And, uh -huh. um, and so you kind of fall down a little rabbit hole. Eventually, I realized, you know, I, I'm still of the opinion that fungi could could save the world if we just allowed it to. Uh, so that is <laughs> just in the way. It. Yeah, exactly. Basically, yeah. <laughs> they, they've been here a lot longer than we have. They know what they're uh -huh. doing. It's um, interesting how many people, especially with with fungi, have started as citizen, you know, people who are interested in them, then became more like amateur citizen scientists of fungi, and then just kept going, as opposed to a lot of other areas where, you know, you study maybe ornithology or study in ology in college. But a lot of the most prominent fungus experts um, came to it from, you know, sort of like you did. Yeah, uh, it's it's funny because I, I I had a discussion with someone when I was first starting out um, a little while ago, or not first starting out uh, in in with think fungi, if you will, not necessarily in foraging. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, I came in from a perspective of of edible food, um, and I believe that you know the majority probably do. You know, a lot of people they they enter into this field through something of interest of their own right um mm -hmm. so some people will come in through biology right they they had an interest in biology and you know mycology just kind of stood out to them and so they entered it through that way but i'd say the majority come from kind of the foraging aspect where you know they they like gardening or they like hunting or they like to do you know some uh -huh. sort of homesteading and uh and mushrooms are, are there right so mm -hmm. they get into the edible first and then you know hopefully with any luck um it goes from just being an edible mushrooms to all mushrooms right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um because there's a lot you know a lot of the ones that are really amazing aren't necessarily the ones that you're going to be eating so right right and it's a whole kingdom right it's not uh it's not as a lot of people might think of it as a fairly 
you know, closed um, uh, group, you know, small group of critters, but, um, but they have an entire kingdom to themselves and all sorts of diversity. Oh yeah, there's more species of fungi than than there are of all the others combined. Mm -hmm. And they're not plants; they're not animals. They're their own. No, way. but if you, for example, if you were to grab the uh, National Audubon uh, Society book here, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. so this is one of the most prominent field guides that we have right now. But it was written in the '70s, um, and in the introduction, it actually says that fungi are plants. So, <gasps> oh no! Um, yeah. So. <laughs> I have been told that the National Audubon Society is putting out a new updated uh, book. Mm. I have been told that they have not committed to a date, but you can pre-order. So ah. they're at that stage, I guess. But uh, wow. so hopefully their introduction won't say that. The wheels anymore. of justice are grind exceedingly slowly, but they're right. getting there. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a difficult world to do uh, field guides for mushrooms because, you know, most of the information, the scientific information anyways, is is really new. I mean, it's coming out in the last like 10 years kind mm -hmm. of deal. Um, and a lot of these binomials, the Latin names for, for the species are, are changing almost daily. So uh -huh. um, to put out a field guide right now almost seems a little, a little silly because it's going to be completely different in, uh, in five years. Mm -hmm. But, you know, since there hasn't been one in 50 years, um, you know, it is probably time for, for them to update their book. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and now, and that's really part of, I'm, I just wanted to get into, you know, this fungi quest or fungi quest, uh, that has just completed. That's really part of it is to get people out there and identifying these things is, is that part of your, um, uh, impetus for starting this, this project, this North American fungi, fungi quest? Yeah. Well, yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of like a lot of people have brought up the fact that there's a lot of observations already on fungi and and, and there are, you know, mm -hmm. uh, if you go to the iNaturalist or, or SITSAI or mushroomobserver.org, um, you know, we have a lot of observations, but um, it doesn't ever hurt to have more. Mm -hmm. um, but really what the caveat here is and what we're hoping to go into uh, into the future is some really good solid identification so um, this year was predominantly uh, oriented towards um, observations getting as many observations as possible and and really getting the general public involved so not just those people who are already doing it um, mm -hmm. but you know the person who never really thought about it or you know school kids or or, or you know just just the general public um, so we didn't want to make anything too confusing so um, we have some bigger plans for next year, for example, that we'll get into a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, right now it's kind of just, let, let's get those observations in. The more observations we have, the better for a variety of different reasons. So um, that really was kind of one of the key goals of, of Fungi Quest. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Do you hope to make it sort of, it reminds me a little bit of the Christmas. I think some people may hear about the, um, the bird count that happens every year. Is this sort of the, a similar idea? Yeah. In fact, we actually use the same. So the, uh, you know, the city nature challenge, I, I mm -hmm. believe you're referring to is part of the Christmas uh, counts as well. Mm -hmm. um, and my understanding is they tend to use BioSmart, um, which is the algorithm platform. And that's what we use for fungi quest as well. As well. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, uh, the idea is to get as many of those observations in um, and to get the right kind of data in as well is, is pretty key. But to put out the map um, is 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 also very important to us. So we okay. essentially want to know which, you know, for, for example, this, the fungi quest that just ended, we had just under, I believe, 10 short of, or seven short of 4,400 species. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. Yeah, you know, if you put that into context, there's about 200 species in North America of birds, I think. Uh huh. So, uh -huh. Uh, you know, there's a good little comparison, right? We had 22, wow. 22 times the amount of total bird species actually documented by Fungi Quest. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So there's a lot out there. I mean, that that really just there's it's estimated there's probably around 11,000 species of of uh, of like mushrooms, um, which kind of have to differentiate from general fungi because um you know any sort of uh mold that's growing on your uh on your orange 
could technically be considered in, in right or or right, exactly. uh, mildew or athlete right, spot exactly. or <laughs> so, <laughs> you aren't including those right you right exactly or, you, know, you can go to the store and find you know uh even even the grocery store will have a number of different yeasts to use for your right. bread right and each one of those right. yeasts is a different species of fungi so mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. um so we differentiate because not many people are going to go to the grocery store and take pictures of the, the yeast right. that they saw right. and upload it to uh um, so when we're talking strictly of the fruit bodies, right, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're estimating, and it's still an estimate, that there's only about 11,000 in North America. Mm -hmm. um, so we documented nearly half of them. Um, yeah. Can you pause there for a second? I need a definition. Fruit body. There you, you go. I was going to ask that too. What is yeah. this? <laughs> so on the screen, you see kind of like, so those are like dead man's fingers on the screen. Right Ew. There. Creepy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so dead man's fingers comes in a variety of different colors and, and looks, but that's essentially what you're actually seeing is the fruit body, right? So I tend to tell people that it's kind of like the apple of the apple tree, right? So the exciting part of the organism. Well, yeah. Exciting. The tree's underground. <laughs> we're not talking mycelial threads or whatnot. We're right, just like right, the, right. the flashy thing, maybe not important. The flashy thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, this is the reproductive organ, if you will, of, of, of the uh, of the entire fungi species, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so that in itself is obviously where you're going to be identifying what that is, right? But you have roughly 3 million species of fungi uh, in the world. Wow. And you have roughly between somewhere, somewhere in the vicinity of 20,000 to 30,000 uh, species that actually produce fruit bodies. Oh, so, okay. You know, that's about 1% of all fungi will create fruit bodies like dead mm -hmm. man's fingers. Mm -hmm. um, and the other 99% don't. So ah. um, those ones are obviously pretty difficult to uh, to, to locate or to, to find, identify, observe. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We do know an awful lot. I mean, you can have uh, a crop of corn that's, you know, uh, been attacked by some sort of fungi. Um, and they can break it down to 10 different kinds of fungi that are attacking that crop, for example, right? So they can do it in a lab. Uh -huh. You're just not going to see it, you know, as, as, your, as your lone self, if you will. So Right. And do you do it in the fall? Is that the time? Is it similar to, um, you know, thing, you know, plants that have fruit, that there's a particular time of year that it's easiest to find uh, mushrooms? So each, each fungi essentially has its own season. Okay if you will. So uh, okay. I would say the majority, so for the Northeast where I am, uh, you know, season pretty much starts in June um, and will end the end of October, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, right now it's still mushroom season out West. So California, all the way up to like Alaska, essentially, maybe Alaska is a little too far North at this point in the uh -huh. year, but um, you know, definitely up to British Columbia and all the way down um, the West coast there, it's still mushroom season there. So uh, when Fungi Quest was actually happening, it was uh, September 15th, October 15th, and I was being informed by those in the West Coast that, you know, it's it's too dry. There's no mushrooms out there for them. So okay. uh, the predominant um, area for, for these observations was the Northeast, where it was really mushroom season, you know, mm -hmm. late late summer, early fall, mushroom mm -hmm. season in the Northeast. But, um, okay. but pretty much when our season wraps up, that's when it goes to the West Coast and also to the South when it starts getting cooler a little bit there. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know it hasn't been that long since, you know, you've just concluded the um, the project, but do you have anything you can share about it or were there any surprises or things that you learned? Uh, we found some rare species. That's always fun. Uh -huh. um, uh, what else? Um, like what? What? What's a rare uh, fun job? It's called, it's called, one of them was called Flame Shield. So they actually won... Um, so we were giving away some prize, some prize giveaways, some prize packages to oh. for certain things, and one of them was uh, best find. And so, but it's all voted on by by peers. So you know, we didn't really have a say in it. Just I suppose maybe they won because it was a rare uh, fungi, uh -huh. and so a lot of people were upvoting it. Okay. Um, but yeah, so it was a flame shield, mm -hmm. uh, which is you know for most people, if you were to look at it, I mean, it's nothing particularly crazy looking. I mean, it, it looks like just an orange cap mushroom uh, uh -huh. but it grows on trees um not from the ground and uh you know the person took all the proper identification photos the top underneath from the side uh for the mushroom actually on the tree and even had a spore print uh, photo mm -hmm. so the person who was taking the photo definitely knew what they were doing 
Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it was a, it's a rare species. And so it was pretty exciting to find that. Yeah. I'm going to pause you again for another definition, spore print. So spore <laughs> spore why, print. Why would we do it? And I actually, I referenced this to my fifth grade students a couple of years ago because we went over mushrooms as a topic and it's always very exciting. But spore mm -hmm. prints, we talked about it briefly, but I'd love to hear it from an actual uh, amateur, as you say, mycologist. <laughs> right. um, yeah, spore prints are, are one of many, realistically, uh, identifying features for, for fungi. Um, you know, essentially the, the concept of it is just put the cap on, on a piece of paper and, you know, something to block any sort of drafts from getting in. So usually just a cup or it could be a bowl, whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, and then the spores, which are basically the seeds of the mushroom, are going to fall out of the cap onto that paper. And uh, from there, you get to see what the color of those spores are. So the, it's really at the end of the day, it's the color that you're looking for, nothing really else. Um, the color will tell you, uh, you know, what kind of mushroom that is among other identifying features. So there is a lot of mushrooms where, um, for example, the black trumpet and the horn of plenty um, are both fairly identical mushrooms. And you could, if you looked under a microscope, you could tell them apart. Um, but another way of doing that without a microscope is to take a spore print. One of them comes out with a white spore print and the other one is kind of like a pinkish spore print. Oh. So even this then they're a... pretty close, but separate. <laughs> yeah, oh, wow. this is this is a tool that uh, foragers, I remember I literally watched a TikTok of a forager. Um, she's one of the more famous ones, but she uh, used a spore print to determine if she found the poisonous mushroom or the one that was safe to eat before using it. It was oh. a similar situation of only looking for the color. The two looked very similar and she was able to figure out which one to go with, which was fascinating to learn about. So yeah, mm -hmm. I usually... For me, usually I always tell people that if you require a spore print, it's probably the uh, 401 kind of level of mushrooms for the foragers, you know, like it's starting to get a little complicated. If you can't tell the difference uh -huh. between a mushroom without the spore print, then a beginner shouldn't be picking it, right? Uh-huh. Um, Good to know. <laughs> but yeah. there, there, there's, you know, there's no hard and, and set rules in, in mushroom foraging anyway. So, uh, you know, a lot of people will ask, you know, is there a specific color I should avoid or a specific shape or anything like that? And there isn't really. I mean, like I said, there's, you know, at least probably, a, say, a good dozen identifying features um, within fungi. And mm -hmm. you just kind of need to hit the check mark for every single one in order for it to be a specific species. So, yeah. yeah. And if you're not sure, then it's best to just avoid that entire group that looks sort of kind of like it might be a dangerous one and just focus on the ones that you can easily identify 100%. Yeah, I mean, the only one that I really back quite often is, uh, you know, white mushrooms with white gills. Um, yeah. So when you have the gills on the underside, mm -hmm. um, you know, your regular button mushroom that you're going to get at the grocery store, if you can think of it in your mind, is a white mushroom, yeah. uh, but the gills underneath are black, right? So those are your basic uh, mushrooms. Now imagine the same thing, but with white gills underneath. Yeah. Um, and the reason why that's Kind of a caveat is because you have the destroying angel which is a white mushroom with oh. white gills and you have the that, death i don't cat. like the name of that <laughs> <laughs> that does not like the sound of that if that's that's on the menu i'm gonna yeah maybe i'm not gonna yeah yeah, gonna yeah you don't want the destroying angel and you don't want the death cap and both of those Definitely. are white mushrooms with white caps they're very prevalent across the continent um mm -hmm. and uh and and they actually are some of the most common mushrooms for for mushroom poisonings and uh -huh. um, and they're not they're you don't want to consume that i guarantee you it's not like a mild toxic it's you know deadly toxic so uh -huh. um it's generally recommended you know other ones if you make a mistake maybe you'll spend the night in the bathroom right um uh -huh. and that's you know uh so so you kind of weigh those little risks sometimes um mm -hmm. but you know really if it's like white mushroom white gills Unless you're, unless you really know what you're doing, just, just leave it, you know, uh -huh, admire it, uh -huh. take a photo. Uh -huh. about that. No. Wait, does this mean that everyone involved in this project, the uh, fun, fungi quest is of a certain level of understanding of all these things? Like, what is the team? Are you all oh, yeah. amateur mycologists? Or are you all, uh, are, are most of them mycologists or where, where is that level? I'm just curious who's grouping together to create this thing. No, this is uh, open to everyone. So there isn't, I mean, I mean, it's it's worth noting that essentially, in terms of the world of mycology, um, I would 
throw out, it's completely uh, arbitrary number really, but I'm gonna say 95% of the people who are contributing information towards mycology are not trained mycologists. Mm -hmm. um, they are amateurs who just absolutely love it and, and mm -hmm. fell down a rabbit hole like myself. Mm -hmm. um, the big issue within mycology is that there's just, no one really pays for a mycologist. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, really the only jobs that often exist for a mycologist kind of go into the, the, the food or like food, fertilizer, um, you know, pesticides or fungicides kind of industries. Um, Cause that's really where, where we as humans have concentrated fungi. So it's either, you know, that fungi that's attacking your crop or it's the fungi that's making your beer. Uh -huh. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's the beneficial and there's, and there's the negative and then everything else we kind of just ignore. Mm -hmm. um, even the ones that we find in the grocery store, there's very little information really on them. I mean, some of them are, are more researched than others, but there's quite a lot of information that we still don't know about even those ones. Um, wow. let alone the ones in the, in the, in the wild. Mm -hmm. So such um, fascinating creatures. You would think that people would want to study them a little more. Again, I mean, I guess we're finally figuring out how to fix the whole error of their plants. No, they're not. <laughs> they're not. Right. And they're more like yeah. animals. <laughs> so I think it was, you know, the, the, the English empire, essentially, I always kind of say this, the, the English empire, wherever it spread its colonies, almost brought this mycophobia to everywhere. Right. Whoa. So, Okay. Um, so we all know the mycophobia exists, right? I mean, everyone is, has been told, I assume at some point in their life, don't touch that. It will kill you. Mm. Um, <laughs> as it refers to the mushrooms, right? Yeah. So that's, you know, a, a fairly crazy concept, um, because, you know, there's about 20% of the mushrooms that are in the woods around you right now will be toxic. So mm -hmm. you have one in five that are toxic and four to five aren't a toxic. And then none of them in North America will harm you if you touch them. So if you eat them, that's a different story, but you can yeah. pick up, you know, any mushroom and it's not going to harm you by touching the mushroom. Right. right. Um, so, and then only one of five are actually going to be toxic. And even that only about 2% are actually like deadly poisonous. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not, you know, you have a worse chance um, of arbitrarily choosing berries in the woods and consuming those, you know, there's not as many species of berries and there's quite a few poisonous ones. So, right. Right. So how, okay. I'm sorry. I, I, so that, that just led me in because no, there aren't too many dangerous ones, but there are some, if you eat them. Um, and, um, between now and the next fundy quest, if you want, if, if somebody wants to get, you know, uh, confident that they can go out and make an identification and contribute meaningfully and maybe even um, uh, collect some for their own consumption um, between now and the next time this launches, what would you recommend people do? Are there clubs? Are there groups? Are there, you know, how do you get into this? Yeah, I mean, so, so right off the bat, I mean, <laughs> Uh, the world of, of mycology tends to be pretty regionalized simply because mushrooms tend to be fairly regionalized. So, uh -huh. um, you know, most states uh, will have their own uh, regional clubs. Okay. Um, in Canada, because our provinces tend to be the size of two to three states, um, we tend to have them more city-based than, than province-based. But in the states, they tend to be more uh, state-based. Okay. So, um, but even then I find, for example, I think Pennsylvania has four mycology clubs, kind of like North, South, East, and West uh, uh, mycology okay. clubs. So, um, you know, even then it can be quite spread out. So there's quite a lot of mycology clubs. Um, and I definitely would recommend getting involved with one of them because they tend to have a good number of experts. They go out in the woods with, you know, their guided tours. Mm -hmm. um, and there's really no replacement for going out, um, uh, going out with experienced people to show you the, those fun ones, sure. you know? Sure. Um, so we, I mean, here in, in Ottawa, we do it uh, with the Ottawa Mycology Club and, you know, even people who are just interested in taking photos, right, really enjoy their photography. Uh, you know, they like to go out, but people who want to know more about the science or more about foraging for edibles, right? So there's all different kinds of people who come out to, the, to these events. Mm -hmm. um, but Definitely in the regional clubs, uh, Think Fungi, which is, um, you know, what I created. Mm -hmm. uh, Think Fungi 
was designed as a community. So it's a free community online where essentially anyone can just join globally and it's nothing but a group of microfiles, right? So um, it's open for anyone to host events if they want. The idea is that if, you know, New York wanted to host a mycology event that was open to, you know, all the others of, of you know, well, Northeast or beyond, right? Mm -hmm. That they could do that, right? I mean, um, because as I said, we're so regional um, in terms of these clubs, I just thought it would be a good idea to have kind of a more expansive group, if you will. So, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, so there's a number of clubs you can join for sure. Right. Okay. That would be my first step. Also field guides. If you're going to go yeah. out, if you are an introvert and you want to go by yourself, then you get your field guides. Um, you, you set aside a few hours, essentially, uh -huh. you go to the woods, you find a mushroom, you flip through the field guide, you find the mushroom, right? Um, yeah. So that's, that's how I started. I mean, yeah. um, but it's much more preferable to go with people who know what they're doing and just learn from them. Stand on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. Right. Good idea. Wow. I was just out... Um, uh, with Seek, uh, just everything that looked like a mushroom, I was trying to get ID'd using that uh, iNaturalist Seek. And it was actually fairly um, responsive. Uh, it pretty much seemed to be, you know, and I wouldn't trust it to eat them or anything, but but it um, uh, it, it seemed to be well-researched and they seemed to have um, uh, a pretty good catalog within there, or a good AI or whatever to identify. Um, I was struck by the colorful names of some of these, do you, I don't know if you would know why mushrooms have such strange names compared to plants or birds or something, but they're kind of, you know, whether it's the red-legged jelly baby or the um, dead man's fingers or the yeah devil's tooth, uh, oh, lion's uh, Yeah, I mean, it's some black earth tongue. Well, I guess that's kind of obvious. Um, yeah, and the um, phallus and yeah, well, hmm. Um, anyway. Uh, <laughs> Colorful. Who's in charge what, of this? Say. Who's in charge? I like to think it's because my colleges have a sense of humor, you know. Okay. Um, really, is it really that? Like, are they just naming them as the as the finders of these species? Well, basically, yeah. So there are some that are obviously more, you know, the fun names, and then there's others that are, you know, named after the person who found them, right? Um, mm -hmm. So Cliff is. I would say that a lot of the people who find mushrooms tend to find a lot themselves. So maybe they might name the first one after them. Uh, but then after that, they're just going to start naming them different times, right? But um, that was mostly true, especially of like, you know, again, like 80 years ago when a lot of these were first starting to be documented and people were finally paying attention to them properly. Mm -hmm. um, and I say 80 years ago, it could go even further back if you're going with the Latin names, of course. Oh, sure. Um, but something like Devil's Tooth or Jelly Baby Fungus, that was probably deemed that name, you know, I'd say within the last hundred years, um, mm -hmm. if not less. Um, but you know, the, the names, the Latin names do not correspond with their common names, right? right. Um, the common names are, are common for us, but they, they differ quite a bit. I mean, there are, there are mushrooms that uh, I know of within, you know, for example, the, there's the uh, green elf cup. Um, it's just a, a staining fungus. I don't know if you guys can see this, actually. I got a little piece of wood here. Oh, nice. Um, but do you, do you see if there's the, the green yeah, nice. tinge to that? You can see the color. But... So, so this, if you were walking through the woods, essentially, you would always That's just, good. yeah. So you'd probably see this green piece of wood uh, in the woods. And you could find this year round. Mm -hmm. uh, this time of year, or maybe about a month ago around here, um, it would actually come up with little, little tiny cups, essentially, like maybe one millimeter across. So they actually have a stem and they all pop up on this and you know, oh. they'll just cover the log with these little, little green cups. So the common name for them, as far as I know, is the green elf cup. Okay. But oh. other people call them the blue elf cup. Other people call them the, the green staining fungus. Other people call them the blue staining fungus. So um, can, it, <laughs> I was just going to say, can we bring up, I have a picture just like, uh, did you have that one with a little on um, the nest uh, fungus that I took in my yard or maybe not? I bird might nest. talk about something It looks else. like a little bird nest with tiny little eggs in it. And yeah. it's, but it's minuscule, but it looks it like what, just what you were describing, but maybe we don't have it. I don't know. I think I do. So what was the, it was the one that you found in your yard? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, got little like light blue, greenish little 
eggs in a little nest and uh oh, maybe it might not be zoomed in enough but let me let me attempt here uh is all it right. the we have the technology nest fungus yes okay i'll share my screen again in a moment there you go I okay. didn't mean to throw you a curve, but just when he said no, that, no yeah, there they are, I don't know these things. <laughs> bird's nest. Yeah, I mean, you I found guess... quite a few of them. I don't oh, know. I had, a, I think I had an actual photograph of that too. I might have shared too, like the actual original photo, but that's okay. Oh, sorry. I don't think I had that one. Anyway, um, pretty cool looking. These are the ones I just found around, <laughs> um, around my house. Um, and yeah. some with very funny names and stuff. But yeah, anyway. that's right. The first time I ever saw that mushroom was actually a photo in a calendar. So it was blown up to be, you know, this big. So and it was completely cool. zoomed in onto one nest. So when I saw it, you know, and this is true for a lot of the uh, the fungi in general, is that uh -huh. you kind of lose um, this comparison of size a lot of the time. Right? Yeah. You see a mushroom kind of in a calendar or on, you know, the internet. And you're like, okay, like if I were to saw that picture up close, like the way I first saw it, I went, yeah. wow, that would be an amazing mushroom to see. And then when I saw it in real life, it turned out to be so small. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, that is a lot different than what I had in mind. Even right. though I'd already seen the mushroom before, I saw it on a completely different scale. So yeah. Um, and, and it's true for a lot. I have I have photos of mushrooms that again, like the elf cup. Um, yeah. you know, they're, they're they're tiny little mushrooms, but when you zoom in and you take that picture, then you can see how beautiful they are and all that. So you really yeah. Know, yeah. but then you miss out on the fact that there's no scale anymore. So right. Well, mushrooms are interesting with scale, right? Because you have these tiny little things that are amazingly intricate, um, you know, fruiting bodies, but they're also, I believe, like the world's largest organism, right? I mean, the the actual um fungus, I believe there's one in Minnesota that's supposed to be the largest organism on earth, single organism. Oregon. Um so kind of messes with your sense of scale when you're talking about a critter. Um both ends of the spectrum. Yeah, so Wait, that's largest... a honey mushroom, and it's in Oregon, not Minnesota. Oh, it's in Oregon. Sorry, yeah. sorry, Morgan. Uh, Better luck next time, Minnesota. Like, it's like tied for for it's tied for first, I think it is, or like they can't really figure out which one because there's an aspen forest as well. It's like an entire forest, but it's one. Oh, tree. and that's one organism, and it's With one stems, organism, and then there stems. was yeah, there's something else. I forget what the other thing is, but the other one is yeah, the honey mushroom. So yeah um, absolutely massive and it's also it's not only the the largest but it's also considered it, it's right up there with the heaviest organism on earth mm -hmm. if you were to compile all that uh mycelium from underground and, and right put it together in one bunch it'd be one of the heaviest organisms on earth like a blue whale and or something. also the yeah. oldest it's about three thousand years old i think it is wow it's whoa like superlative wow. I thought the 500 year old shark was cool that's that's yeah. different yeah. <laughs> it's too and it's still going, right? It's not going to go anywhere anytime soon either. Wow. Um, we, there was, sorry, Bob, there was a, a, a suggestion in the chat about a specific yes. mushroom and it kind of like brought a memory up. There's a type of mushroom that's being like used in coffee nowadays. And I'm curious if you know the background of that. I think it's the chaga one. Is that the right yeah. one? So yeah. what it, uh, Heather shared that one in the chat. And I'm so glad you did because I was looking at science for that. I was like, is that real? What is that? What uh -huh. is what is going on there since there isn't like the go-to like mycology is a lot of just people who are curious right so it's yeah it's interesting yeah. to hear about these ones being used in these things so do you have any info about that one by chance uh so chaga is interesting so for a very long time essentially they thought that basically one of the highest uh foods that you can consume for antioxidants was berries the berries are just astronomical mm -hmm. you know there was a lot of anti antioxidants in berries compared to other food then they did tests on chaga and it like blew berries out of the water. Really? Um, so that's essentially why chaga became like a superfood. Um, but you'd have, you, ha you kind of have to know that, right? I mean, right. a lot of other people, like other superfoods, everyone knows that, you know, this, this, and this are superfoods, right? Um, but you tell people chaga and they still don't even know what it is, even if it's considered to be a superfood. Um, um. Really what it is, is, well, it's a fungus, but <laughs> if in... <laughs> If you were to imagine it, it's essentially wood. Um, so you you were never you would never eat it because it would be like eating wood. Um, it grows, it kind of breaks through a birch tree. So it was always found on birch trees and it kind of just breaks through and then it becomes this big hardened crust. Most people take it off with like a hatchet, you know, so you're not just like cutting it off with a little, you know, mushroom oh, knife wow. or something. You're like hacking it off with a, with a hatchet. 
Um, and then it's broken down into either chunks or straight down into like, you know, uh, granules kind of thing. But, and then you essentially just soak it in and has it as tea. So oh, there we go. There you go. So as you can see, that doesn't look particularly appetizing. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that's like, is, is it like a mycorrhizal thing where it interpolates itself right into the wood and they become like one big thing or, or is that just the fungus? Do you think? Uh, no, if anything, it'd be parasitic. Um, mm -hmm. parasitic slash saprophytic. So, um, a lot of, a lot of different fungi species kind of play multiple roles in this regard. So mycorrhizal, they tend to just be mycorrhizal, um, you know, being off the, the actual plants themselves. Yeah. Um, but the parasitic plants, uh, can be both and, and saprophytic tend to be. So, um, so yeah, chaga will really only grow on trees that are, uh, dying or are mm -hmm. dead, uh, okay. but usually dying already. And, you know, it kind of speeds up the process of, of, of it uh, dying, just like pretty much any parasite might do, mm -hmm. kind of just sucks out some of the lifeblood yeah. of, of, of the plant. Um, so a lot of people have no real qualms with harvesting it because, you know, yeah. it's a dying tree anyway, so why okay. not? Um, there are certain conservational uh, components to harvesting it such as, um, so the chaga will continue to grow if, if you, you know, don't completely kill the tree. So one of the arguments is, or one of the ideal situations is to harvest it in late fall or even the winter. So it's one of the only mushrooms that I actually harvest in the winter because it's not going anywhere. It's just, you know, like I said, it's like wood. Yeah. Um, and here I get a few meters of snow. So I can actually go on my snowshoes through the woods and reach areas of trees that I couldn't otherwise. Oh, so um, it allows me to access that chaga quite easily. Uh -huh. um, and when you remove it in late fall or in winter, there's no bugs around, right? So those beetles aren't getting inside of the tree and completely killing that tree immediately, essentially. Mm -hmm. So if I harvest the chaga right now compared to middle of summer, if I do it in the middle of summer, a lot of people say, hey, listen, the tree's already dying. I don't what's the problem here and the idea is okay well you you take it now the beetles get inside the beetles just completely annihilate that tree next year that tree is pretty much not there yeah. right and it's not going to provide you with any chaga or anything so if you were to do it in the winter then just like pruning a tree right when you prune a tree you also do it late fall winter or early spring so that it can yeah. kind of seal itself it's as its own resin yeah. before this before the summer starts right so it's the same concept um, wow. So, so you are a chaga aficionado. So you, yeah, uh, <laughs> what do you do with it? You, do you, do you grind it up and. Honestly, I don't do anything with it. I don't, I don't really harvest it anymore. <laughs> oh, you don't. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. No, I, okay. I found the taste to be too, too, um, unpleasant. I mean, recall that I used to be a chef. You. So to me, it's, <laughs> All right. you know, the things that I consume, I, I, I want to really enjoy the things that I consume. Uh -huh. And chaga isn't the greatest tasting thing on earth. So it's like drinking tree. So and yeah, not like maple syrup, you know, which is delicious, but like it's more medicinal tree. than um, culinary. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And okay. and 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 that's the thing. A lot of you know, again, a lot of the I, I mentioned this, I think, at the very beginning. A lot of the mushrooms that are probably like the most important to our society at the moment um, aren't the edible ones. They're actually the, the medicinal ones. Mm -hmm. um, it's the medicinal ones like turkey tail that have been used, you know, cancer treatments these days are, are huh. uh, increasingly giving like capsules or, or, or um, uh, um, of turkey tail. So it, it essentially allows you to, or one of the benefits of it is that it helps your body kind of process the chemo and radiation better. It's just immunity boosting essentially, hmm. but fungi in general, pretty much all fungi, uh, so far, as far as I see, it's always one of the top criteria uh, or benefits of basically any mushroom I've seen, which is immunity boosting. They're huh. really good at boosting your immune, your immune system. Um, and turkey tail is, is just one of those. So, oh, wow. And it is um, turkey tail for you. Now, again, we are not, um, just as a disclaimer, uh, <laughs> we're not medically trained and we're not telling you to go out and eat all of these things, um, right now, but, but this is, uh, for just your, uh, in interest and uh, background information. Talk to your doctor before consuming turkey tails, um, especially right off the tree.
Yeah, don't eat them off the tree ever. Do not eat them. All. Okay, there we go. So <laughs> don't eat them off. Even if your doctor tells you to, do not eat turkey tails. Don't do that. Tree. No, no. <laughs> um, you know, a lot. So first off, any wild mushroom should be cooked, and anyone who tells you otherwise is doing so at their own risk. Oh. So just keep that in mind. Um, right. Some people are still very much like, well, I do it. Like, okay, well, that's fine, right? Mm. You Hard can do whatever like you want to do for yourself, right? Um, okay. But it is generally recommended practice to cook any wild mushrooms. In fact, it's generally good recommended practice to, to cook any mushroom, uh, even yeah. the ones at the grocery store. Um, okay. And the main reason behind that is for the actual nutritional benefit. Um, it's not. It's not necessarily because you know. Some people will be like, well, you should cook the button mushrooms in the grocery store because they're grown on poop. They're not grown on poop, right? That's, that's a ridiculous falsehood. Um, you know, that would not be very, very good for contamination uh, purposes. And that would not be very good for selling at a grocery store if it was grown on poop. No, um, no, no. They, they, but, they certainly wouldn't put that in the ads. Right, exactly, <laughs> right? Um, but the thing about mushrooms is that they have a very particular cell structure to them. Mm -hmm. um, and in order to, for your body to actually absorb those nutritional uh, benefits of, of the fungi, uh, you essentially need to break down those cell walls. And the only way to really do it is through heat. So, um, that's why you can do it. You know, if you're, if you're not cooking them and eating them, you know, if it's like turkey tail, then you might be making teas out of them. Um, or you can go through the alcohol extract process as well for tinctures. Oh. Um, but you pretty much always have to cook them in order to break down those cell walls and actually consume those benefits so oh excellent good advice yeah. now i know I, this is going so quickly but uh do we have time for questions or, or or what is it emma how are we doing sorry i the chat has a couple of funny comments that i just wanted to point <laughs> out in terms of the topic that might have been distracting you i'm sorry um but thank you heather for giving your commentary on these things i am loving this so especially <laughs> you want to cook them because there might be bugs in them anyway <laughs> so beware um, so they hide in their lovely gills, I'm assuming. Oh gosh. And most of those medicinal ones are not tasty and reishi is gross. Make a tea. All right. Reishi is extremely bitter. Wow. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. But and it's also a powerhouse of a mushroom. So ah. does it, is it also an antioxidant type? It, it's, it's an everything. It's like an immortal mushroom is essentially one of the arguments. Like, yeah. Yes. Everyone the, should consume it. Centennial? Is it part of like one of the centennial communities? Is it called the centennial communities, the hundred years and older groups that are like using certain, I don't, oh gosh, some random Nat Geo video I watched probably from a million years ago. Um, <laughs> it's like the blue and eh, it's okay. It doesn't matter. Um, but that is interesting that it's known as like the, like all the things immortal wow. type uh, help. Okay. And Darlene, thank you for the, for the turkey's tail joke for Thanksgiving. Yeah, yeah. I enjoyed uh, that. <laughs> Um, I do want to, um, oh yeah, Heather, if you wanted to share, since you're a mycologist too, you might have something oh, to yeah. add for, uh, for Robert's commentary here. I'm going to find you on my list really fast. Sure. If I can do that, if you would like to talk, you don't have to, but I'm just going to hit a button so you'd be allowed to talk if you would like to Oh. and share your interest or comments or reactions or anything you'd like, but you're not on the spot. Yeah. I this is Heather. Um, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm not a my. I'm not a mycologist. I just like mushrooms a lot, and I've studied a lot, and foraged a lot, and things like that. So no, I'm very super amateur. <laughs> but you've been involved. Were you a part of this event, the Fungi Quest, Fungi Quest, and, and, and all of the above quest? No. Honestly, I just saw this thing come up and I was like, this is super interesting and I want to join. So I, yeah, nope. <laughs> oh, okay. So you weren't a part of that. Do you think you're going to be a part of it for next year, potentially, since you're interested? It was actually part of what I was thinking of is like, I didn't know about it ahead of time, but just saw the, like the results come up. So I was like, I'm joining this so I can know about what's going on with it. So I can absolutely do it next time. So. Oh, great. Yeah. Absolutely. That's actually an excellent sub, uh, segue if we're okay with talking about the 2023 20, uh, goals. I know that this was um, that this was a part of uh, the information that we got with Robert before this. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again um, in the meantime. So just to give us a good look at to like what we can look forward to um, for 2023, can you give us some information or walk us through what we what we know so far? 
Yeah, so 2023 is likely to be uh, quite different. So this was our first year, 2022, um, and you know we we learned a lot uh, about it, and we, the, you know there was definitely some uh, differences um, with regards to our our uh, observations, the number of observations we got compared to uh, what the platforms may have received. So we're we're looking into that because we might have actually, um, you know, we received. And, and what we have advertised uh, is that we have found about 148,000, just over 148,000 observations. Um, but my understanding is that it's possible that we've actually gone somewhere near 170,000, uh, but some of the observations got lost in the, in the, in the data. Um, so I'm not 100% sure about that, but so, you know, those are small little kind of data-driven things that we're going to be uh, investigating going into 2023. Um, but 2023, we're also hoping, and, uh, and it says it over there um, on the slide, is uh, DNA sequencing. Um, mm. Within the mycology world, there is a, a small but mighty uh, group of people who do DNA sequencing. And um, you know, it, it's fairly important in the world of mycology to have that DNA sequencing because there is a lot of mushrooms, kind of like I mentioned about the... Uh, the National Audubon book there, you know, there's a lot of things that have changed in the last 10 years, but there's a lot uh, that still needs to be changed going forward. Um, a lot of the species names are incorrect. Um, there's a lot of species that are still being discovered, but mo most importantly is that we don't know what species, you know, we really have here. And, and that's the interesting thing. So when we say, you know, that we think that we have around 11,000 fruit bodies or different fungi that create fruit bodies in North America, um, it's an approximate, right? We can, we can tell you pretty much guaranteed how many exact species of birds there are, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we couldn't tell you that number of, of fungi or even, you know, mushroom fruit bodies. And so right. what we really need to do is get out there and, and find all the mushrooms that we possibly can. And so 2022 was really just about that. It was spread the word, get as many people out to make observations, as many observations as possible is, is the goal because, you know, eventually, you know, for every 1000 observations you get, one of them is going to be a rare species, right? Or maybe it'll be a new species, but uh -huh. we won't even know generally if it's a new species unless that DNA sequencing is also occurring because so many of these mushrooms actually look uh, so similar to others. And the only way of knowing that it's actually a different mushroom is yeah. through DNA sequencing. So yeah, um, that's going to be a big thing, I hope, in 2023. Some of them, we're still trying to figure out how to incorporate it and how to make it effective um, because it requires, you know, some lab stuff. Um, yeah. So, uh, so that's something that we're definitely going to be working on going forward. But yeah. Um, Wow. That'll yeah, be, yeah, that's, I mean, that's so, uh, it, it just, we're probably going to learn so much then because, you know, in other organisms, you have mimicry, you have things we might find, oh, these mushrooms that we always thought was the same mushroom, one's mimicking the other. So other things don't eat it, or it's mimicking the other. So it attracts other, or all sorts of complexity going on within the communities that will be revealed by doing the sequencing that you'd never get by just ob observation. Yeah, no, it, it's it's actually pretty important because that, that that's the really the thing with with mycology is that we are just so under researched. Yeah, um, and and that's why it's really important. I mean, it doesn't really matter if you're a professional mycologist or not at this point because you know things like DNA sequencing is actually it's no longer like it used to be in let's say the '80s or or '90s. You know, it's actually a lot more accessible. So people who are interested in that could actually go and spend a few hundred dollars or essentially get the equipment to do this, right? But you have mm -hmm. to have the right, you know, not everyone's interested in doing that. So, um, but those who, who do want to do it can yeah. get the equipment, can bring it home, can do DNA sequencing at home. There are Facebook groups and all sorts of people who are doing mycolo uh, mycology DNA sequencing, right? Wow. And who share, you know, all sorts of the uh, the different DNA sequences to, to be able to identify uh, these fungi. So, um, and, and it's it's just important to do because if the labs can't do it, if the funding isn't there from the private sector and the government and everywhere to to find this out, then someone's got to do it, right? Yeah, yeah, um, cool. Yeah. So right. we're really hoping that's going to be the big thing next year.
Super. That's great. I love those goals. Um, I wanted to make a quick plug because we had another individual on our uh, in our attendee list who added a Q&A just as a quick plug for her mycological mycological society uh, that's in central Texas. It's uh, based in Austin, Texas, um, that is focused on a lot of education, online education events. So just a really good example of like they're everywhere, right? There are societies everywhere. And can you remind me what's your local or do you have a local specific one? Yeah, so I'm the president of the Ottawa Mycological Society. Um, but, you know, for us, for example, our, our group is just found on the Think Fungi community. So the, again, the Think Fungi allows, you know, thinkfungi.org, essentially, you go there, you join the community, and um, I'm hoping that a lot of these mycological associations, some of them have already done it, but essentially they're creating their groups on that, uh, on the Think Fungi community. So they can share stuff within their own community with their own members. Uh, but they can also choose to give it to the entire global community, right? So if they have an event coming up, um, you know, let's say in, in Austin uh, for, you know, whether it be a mushroom festival or just a guided tour, um, you know, they could just tell their members about it, but they could also tell, you know, essentially the world about it. Because if I was traveling down to Texas and I, I knew that, you know, the mushroom festival was going on, you, I would definitely go and visit it, right? I mean, why wouldn't I? Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's it's just good to kind of spread that word to, to more than just your members. And so that's kind of where the whole Think Fungi community kind of comes around. Right. It's a giant community. I love it. It's very, I mean, the focus on building the community simply, I mean, potentially part of it being out of like the necessity, right? If there's no, if if it's not as strong in terms of like funding for research and such, that's, it's a big deal to build a giant community like this. So I think definitely yeah. worth an applause for uh, the uh, fungi quest. I am so stuck on whether or not to call it fungi, fungi, or fungi quest. I have ruined my- Yeah, I just saw it there. real, yeah. <laughs> oh, so it's fungi, great. it's fungi. And the reason- Oh, that is that official? Is it, it, it is official. And the Woo! reason people might want to argue me here, but the thing is that in Latin, the I sound does not exist. Oh, uh, that's right. A E is like A uh, sort of in between, and I is E. Right. So you can't say fu fungi because it ends with I, and that sound is not in Latin. So fungi is not a thing. It would have to be uh, fungi. All right. So wow, reference. fungi. You could say fungi, fungi I suppose, too. But, so there's only fungi yeah. and fungi. Wow. Well, that's okay. Um, that is good to know. I didn't even think about everything. that. <laughs> awesome. You know what? Again, I was I was I was calling it fungi for the longest time. It was about uh, two months ago, actually, that my dad told me, "You know, you're wrong," because <laughs> he studied Latin. And I went, "All right." I went, no, you, that okay, can't be no. true. So I went and I googled it, and I went, "Oh man, he's right." So I had oh, to admit to my dad that he was uh, right that I was saying fungi uh, incorrectly the entire time. And, but you're not the only um, one. No, <laughs> thank God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm definitely mispronouncing it constantly. Um, Bob, do you want to close out anything else? No, I just want to thank you. I mean, there's so many other things I was going to ask about truffles. I was going to ask about all the, <laughs> but, I, but we have to be mindful of the, this only goes till three o'clock, right? Which is now, huh? Yeah. <laughs> which I can't. We'll have to have part two. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I, which I, because we're out of time, I'm so sorry, but yes, one, like a thousand thanks to you for joining us. And also for our attendees who are uh, amateur mycologists. I love it. Thank you so much for joining us yeah. um, and giving your advice on these things. It was lovely to hear about them. Um, but just to give you a good idea of what's coming up next, in case you are um, planning on joining us for any of these, next week we are talking about uh, bringing marine debris, uh, marine debris uh, to art for in honor of like steam. So bringing art to all of our STEM subjects. So we're going to talk about the America Recycles Day on the 15th. Ooh. And then the following week, we have a very special one that Roland's actually hosting um, fully in Arabic, uh, which is going oh. to be crazy awesome for our international audiences who um, speak Arabic. So mm -hmm. uh, we're excited for that. And then we're going to uh, be talking about the Essential Citizen Science Gift Guide on the 29th, which Bob will be back again for that one. Yeah. Yeah. And that's going to be great because yeah. citizen scientist on your holiday shopping list. Yeah. Um, if you have, uh, any interest moving forward in uh, having any events? This goes for you as well, Robert. Um, but any events that come up in the near future, especially as we get closer to April with Citizen Science Month, um, we want to help you uh, with your events. And so if there are any, it's always an option to add your event um, through our resource, the scistar.org slash add dash event um, to help promote it. 
Um, and as well as that, we have an entire website for citizenscienceMonth.org. If you're curious, um, it is all about um, it is all about uh, bringing citizen science to your community specifically. Uh, Heather, I'm looking at your question right now. So it is okay, not weird. Oh, not at all. No, you definitely should be on here. Everyone is welcome. This is yeah. for anyone interested in, in citizen science, in the topic specifically, a professional in these topics, anyone. We're, we're happy to talk to all of you. Yeah, we're so glad to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Um, yeah. Lastly, before I lose you all, we have a million resources that we send via email. And so we will happily do that again. Um, but I did want to make a quick plug because for our survey that we've been sending out, we're looking um, to get some more information as we move closer to Citizen Science Month. Um, so I made a QR code to make it easier to do, which it still takes only two minutes to do. So if any attendees would like to take two minutes of their time to take the survey that we have, that would be incredibly helpful. Um, and uh, we have our lovely uh, confirm or our registration link already ready for next week if you are interested in joining us for America Recycles Day. And I just spoke a mile a minute to get through all that. So uh, thank you for sticking with me if you did. Um, yeah. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thanks, thank Robert. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> thank you for having me, guys. This is fantastic. I loved it. Yeah, this is such a fun conversation. So I'm happy, sad to see it end before I feel like it had a chance to talk through all of it. But yeah, we're, there's many conversations to be had maybe next year, right? Or during Citizen Science Month. Always yeah. a chance. We'll talk mushrooms. Sounds good. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and stop my share and and uh, buy Facebook if anyone's on Facebook with us. Bye. See you next time. <laughs> if I can do that, there we go. And I will stop our recording. Make sure we're off because.